you write a, a book recently translated into Romanian about the world before the Second World War, but yes. from the perspective of the present somehow. What did you discover about that world and what did you know before? Um, actually, when I started to write the book, I, uh, I didn't think that it relates so much to the, to the present. Mm -hmm. Because uh, my intention was um, to write about the world where my family came from uh, before the war, because I was very interested in their life. In Israel, you hear a lot about the Holocaust and about, uh, you know, uh, World War II. But uh, the fact is that uh, the Jewish people lived uh, hundreds of years in uh, Eastern Europe. And uh, we almost learned nothing about it in Israel, like uh, what were their daily lives, uh, what did they do, um, what did they wear, all sorts of stuff. So I became really interested in, in a world that I thought that is uh, already gone because uh, you don't see communities like that in Europe today. Mm -hmm. There are no shtetls. Um, so uh, this was my, my, my initial intention, but when I started to do more and more research and uh, when I wrote the book, I realized that there are, uh, you know, a lot of uh, themes and subjects and issues that are relevant today. You can start even from the first uh, premise of the book, which is, uh, you know, uh, uh, Fanny Kaisman, who is going to, uh, to find the, the lost husband of her sister, who left her aguna, we say in Hebrew aguna, and, and uh, I don't know the right word in English, but it's probably chained woman or something like that. Like she, so this problem exists today as well in Judaism. Uh, when a husband leaves his wife, uh, she cannot get a divorce. Unless, he's, uh, unless he agrees. Uh, and also when I started to do more research about um, the Jewish community mm -hmm. and the relationship between uh, the Jewish community and the locals. So I found a lot of uh, things that are still relevant for today. Uh, it's true that today, for example, in Israel, we are the majority and we have a minority living within us. They could be the Orthodox Jews, that could be Arabs, that could be... But, uh, you know, a lot of the things that we experienced as a minority back then in the 19th century, and, uh, you know, we had a lot of uh, criticism and a lot of... Uh, complaints against the local regime so we now have see the same only now we are the the majority the majority yeah so um, and the secret police you know you hear about uh, the okrana or the the kgb and you know my, my parents came from romania so we heard a lot about uh, the securitate and all of the methods which are also operated today in Israel, only this time with, uh, with our secret forces. So, you know, like a lot of the things you see back then are still relevant today. And, uh, you know, even my experience as a soldier, you know, I wrote about the Crimean War and about the... Uh, so you see that the experience of a soldier in the 19th century are not so different than a soldier in the yeah. 20 or 21 century. They still think about the same things. They still have the same difficulties. So I was actually surprised to see that the world is not that different. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and when I went to, you know, the story takes place in Belarus. So when I went to Belarus, to visit those places, I saw that they are not even different in terms of the geographical scenario and the way that I imagined it to be. Mm -hmm. 
in the 19th century, like I, I, I was in uh, Belarus in 2014, I think, or something like that. And I Lukashenka, saw- Lukashenka was there. Lukashenka yes, was there. yes, he yeah, was now. still there. He was still there. And, uh, you know, you see, first of all, you see that the people are not very enthusiastic to speak about, you know, uh, about the government and about Lukashenko. And you see that uh, they're still doing laundry in the river and uh, there's no electricity in many of the houses and, you know, toilets are in the yard. So you see the shtetl with no Jews, but you still see how they lived. So, um, so a lot of the things are still relevant today. What about the social, the social memory there in Belarus, for example, the legacy of those Jewish communities? Yes. Uh, do they exist in the social memory there? It's actually very interesting because uh, when I went there and I started to talk with the locals, and they heard that I'm a writer and that I'm coming from Israel. So they immediately started to speak about uh, what happened in the Holocaust. Because, uh, you know, I, I, I talked with some uh, old ladies, you know, they were over 90. So they remember uh, what neighbors. happened. Yes. So they started to speak with me about what happened and uh, how they took the Jews from the houses and they were very afraid. And, uh, and, and I listened to that and I told him, okay, what happened before that? How, how were the, and it took a lot of time until they realized that I'm not really interested in hearing about the Holocaust, but I'm asking about uh, the life before that, because nobody asked them before mm -hmm. about uh, their Jewish neighbors. So they started telling me really interesting stories about for example, in one place, they told me how uh, the rabbi was considered a, a very smart person. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, and, and the local priest, they, he was a bit drunk and a bit, so uh, anytime they needed an advice or something, they used to go to the rabbi, even, even if they were Christians. Mm -hmm. And they told me that uh, the Jewish uh, band, the Kleisemer band, Mm -hmm. used to play in uh, Christian weddings. <laughs> so anyway, they started to, to, to tell me about all sorts of, you know, I don't think there was such a big love between the Jews and the, and the locals, but there was also not uh, as we in Israel imagine it to be, or as we learn, you know, the Jewish people were all day long sitting in their houses and waiting for uh, for someone to to uh, you know to to burn their house or uh, or attack them. It wasn't like that at all. They were a normal relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, they did a lot of things together. Obviously, they didn't marry each other, or there wasn't uh, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm any uh, family relations, but some of them were really good friends and, uh, and it was more or less a normal uh, sort of, uh, you know, I, I realized that most of the anti-Semitic attacks and uh, programs and they were mostly caused from people outside of the shtetl, like people coming from the outside, usually they were, uh, you know, uh, people of the lower classes yeah. and uh, they weren't uh, definitely, they weren't the majority. And uh, so I realized that there was a much more to, to learn and to investigate than just to reduce Jewish life in Europe as, uh, as you know, uh, as a matter of, uh, you know, uh, uh, the victim and, uh, and the oppressor. It, it wasn't like that. Yeah, because you say, uh, you told the victim and the, the oppressor, you are using in this book uh, some Yiddish words. Yes. Uh, and I would like to, to talk about this a little bit. Of course, you have a PhD in Wittgenstein, so language is very important for you. But yeah. my question is, 
uh, Yiddish was for a long time a language that people want to forget. It was seen like a language of victims, even in Israel. What yes. is the situation now? Yes, yes. Unfortunately, when all the Jews came from Europe to Israel, mm -hmm. then uh, first of all, uh, they were asked to forget their uh, history, their legacy, you know. Uh, uh, they, they weren't allowed to speak Yiddish, you know, there was even, uh, if you would speak Yiddish in Tel Aviv in the 50s, they would find you. There, will, there would be a police mm -hmm. officer that can uh, give you a ticket for speaking Yiddish on the street. Because they wanted to create the new Israeli. The new Israeli is not a victim is someone strong and he's, uh, you know, he's not to be taken to the slaughterhouse again. Mm -hmm. He would fight, he would... Uh, so this was the kind of uh, ethos that uh, was here in Israel. Uh, but as you probably know, it's very hard to forget your... Uh, it's your not history. currency, psychological currency. Exactly, exactly. Especially if you grew up you know, in these places, even, even if you were in the Holocaust. But then again, you grew up in certain places, you carry some, you know, uh, emotional uh, experience, which is very important for your personality. Mm -hmm. And you can't simply push it off. And uh, I think that for me, by the way, coming from that my, my parents, I think, uh, and my grandparents are a bit different because uh, after the war, my grandfather and grandmother, they came back to Romania. Mm -hmm. And then they weren't allowed to come to Israel or America or any other place because of the communist uh, government. So they actually stayed in Romania for, for many years. And my parents were born in Romania after the war. So it was a, a very strange mix that my father, my grandfather was, uh, you know, he was a survivor from Auschwitz. And my parents were born in Romania and they still remained there for many years to come. You know, my parents still have a very good friends from Romania. They travel like four or five times a year to visit their friends. And uh, so they have, uh, you know, very close friends mm -hmm. in Romania and uh, they have very good memories from Romania. They left Romania during communism? During, yeah, but only in the 60s. Uh, I think they came to Israel in uh, maybe 67, 8, 9, something like that. So their entire childhood was uh, in uh, Romania. Uh, so growing up in this kind of family, I always, you know, I always got some mixed emotions because, uh, you know, every time I see my grandfather with a number on his left arm and those dreadful stories about Eastern Europe and the Germans and Auschwitz and et cetera, et cetera. And then I hear from my mother about her childhood experience from, uh, from Yassi, from uh, Pashkani. My father came from Satmar, Satmare. Mm -hmm. So they tell me childhood memories and you know, these emotions are, are kind of mixed. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, from an emotional point of view, this is what made me kind of want to go uh, before World War II and, and, and try to see what was really happening between uh, Jews and Christians in, uh, in uh, you know, in uh, 19th century and early 20th century uh, Europe. And you found out that uh, maybe the, polit the politicians yeah. speculate all this yeah. uh, xenophobia. It happens today also. Right. Mr. Orban. It happens today in Israel, you know, uh, people forget that 20% of the Israeli populations are Arabs, okay? People don't know it, but, you know, when I go to the hospital, when I go to the, I may be treated by an Arab doctor, 
And when I go to, a, I don't know, a restaurant, it might be owned by an Arab uh, owner. And uh, so our life are intertwined. We are, we are working with one another. I have good friends who are Arabic, you know. So from a political point of view, there seems to be a lot of, uh, uh, you know, interest from many sides to depict it as if uh, we're enemies. <laughs> it is easier to speculate people's fear. Yes. In but, order to... Yes, exactly. But also in Europe, you know, when my mother woke up in the morning in uh, Yassi, she went to school with her Christian friends and they studied together and they played in the afternoon and uh, my father as well. And also not only after the war, but also before the war, you know. Mm-hmm. Now my new book is, uh, I'm going to the to the 30s. So uh, I see, you know, there are many uh, Jewish communities and they're intertwined with the Christian communities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are a lot of activities together. And, you know, there are a lot of, uh, you know, when you go to the park, so you meet all sorts of people from all sorts of kinds. And by the way, when I went to Belarus in the, in 2014, it was a bit sad to see that uh, those very same shtetls are right now pretty much, everyone looks the same, everyone talks in the same language. I don't know, for me, I like the variety. I like to live in a place where you see all sorts of people from all sorts of colors and all sorts of languages. And I think that uh, it's more interesting to live in a place like that than, you know, so I think everyone lost from World War II, uh, both yeah. Christians and uh, Jews. Even Romania during World War II and then during communism, Romania has lost yes. its minorities. Yes. Jewish minorities, German minorities, yes. and it's pity. Uh, you mentioned, you have mentioned this cleavage between uh, Jews and Arabs in Israel. Yes. What about the cleavage between uh, Ashkenazi, Sephardi, and Mizrahi. Yes, yes. It's still there? Oh, it's still there, definitely, because um, what I talked about, the uh, Jewish people that came from Europe and they were, uh, they were, you know, they were asked to forget their history. Mm-hmm. So people from, uh, who came to Israel from North Africa, uh, were also asked to forget their legacy. You know, people who grew up in Morocco, in Iraq, in Iran, in Libya, in Yemen. So they were asked to kind of take off all those uh, customs and traditions and to become really Israeli. And the second pro- problem is that most of them came after the Ashkenazim, after the so, you know, everything was already organized or a bit organized. So they were basically, um, you know, they got uh, less than people who were already here and already, you know, a bit more, uh, let's say, uh, you know, had some money, had some uh, assets. And, uh, and, and I have to say that uh, even though it happened, uh, I don't know, 50, 60, 70 years ago, you can still see uh, the tension. You can still see the tension between uh, Jewish who came from uh, uh, East Europe and Jews who came from, uh, and it's actually only, even though a lot of time have, have passed, it's actually getting worse and worse with time. Because there are many issues that are not, you know, every time you try to uh, push away and, or I don't know, swipe it under the rug. It you, are won't... Poison, you are poisoning something else. Exactly. Freud, Freud, Freud said that. Exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, uh, so yeah, we have a lot of conflicts. Ashkenaz and, uh, and uh, 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 Mizrahim, we have uh, religious against seculars. Yeah. Arabs and Jews. So, you know, Israel is, uh, you know, <laughs> very complicated. <laughs> yeah, but this, this complicated country is beautiful because yeah. it's complicated. Yeah, I, I love it. I think I wouldn't want to, you know, I lived in many places in my life. And mm. uh, 
you know, I feel that uh, even though there are many problems here, it's also a very interesting place mm -hmm. to live in. Do, and, you, uh, do, you, do you like Tel Aviv or Jerusalem more? Because uh, they are so different. Like yeah, now I'm speaking to you from Jerusalem, by the way. The, this <laughs> office is in Jerusalem. But, uh, you know, I love I loved Tel Aviv. I love Jerusalem. They are very different. You know, Tel Aviv is more like Bucharest and... Uh, Jerusalem. I don't know if you have a city yeah, that is... I, li I like Tel Aviv because it gives me uh, the impression that it's under construction. Yes. It's something really alive. This entire alive. country is under construction. This entire country is a construction site. Uh, but Jerusalem, you know, is, it's uh, maybe more historical and more interesting, but it's also more heavy. And it's also more, you know, when you come to Jerusalem, every stone here has a story and, uh, you know, there's a lot of tension in Jerusalem and there's one place in Jerusalem that can blow up the entire world. So it's a very kind of uh, uh, mixed emotions when you come to Jerusalem. Tel Aviv is, is more a free spirit, secular, liberal, you know, uh, it's like a, a fortress of, uh, of sanity. Uh, in uh, in this, I I, I want to say Israel, but it seems like the entire world is going insane. So uh, you know, uh, yeah. When you see what's happening in the U.S. right now or in in other places, so. in France, where Marine Le Pen, uh... yes, France, Hungary, right now is a bit also going crazy. Italy so, and so on and so on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I would like to return a little bit uh, to your book. The central concept here, and I really like it, is this tikkun olam. Yes. I've got the chance to talk a little bit about tikkun with, with Eshol Nevo. Yes. But it was a different perspective. Yeah. I'd like to ask you to explain what it means on both levels, individual one and social one, and what is the difference from, I don't know, Christian confession? Because when you are Christian, you confess your yes. what you have done uh, yes. wrong, and that's it. Yes. Well, tikkun. First of all, the, the book in Hebrew is called tikkun, tikkun achar chatzot. So it's a very meaningful uh, expression and word. And you're right that it's very. It's like the center of the book. Mm -hmm. It's a very. On the one hand, it's a very personal expression, a personal, and it it represents a journey. Like uh, in Judaism, the uh, you know, human beings are, are supposed to experience in life a journey of, of a tikkun. Mm -hmm. Like it's something that is endless. In contrast to a confession, when you come to confess and God forgives you, a tikkun is an endless journey of, first of all, from the individual perspective, working on oneself. Uh, which means that you always have to uh, criticize yourself and you always have to uh, think what you did, uh, revise your relationship with other people and with God mm -hmm. and see uh, what you can do about it. You know, we have a day in the year that we fast for 25 hours and uh, we think about everything we did this year and try to uh, ask forgiveness uh, from God, which is more similar to confession, but the rest of the year, uh, tikkun is supposed to be uh, like trying to kind of uh, uh, assemble the pieces of your personality and reorganize the pieces of your personality to be more with uh, with with God, with you know, with uh, with morality with ethics. Uh, so this is on the one hand, and tikkun olam is on the social level, which means that, uh, you know, it's not a coincidence that I chose to focus in my book on the, like, when, when I thought, who would accompany Fanny in her journey, you know, who would go with her? So there's always uh, the opportunity of, uh, of uh, you know, choosing the more central people in the community, like the rabbi or the rich people. But I chose to, um, to let her be in the company of the, you know, the outskirts of society. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
like the, the, the complete margins of society, because I think that if you want to, if you want to understand the society, you will learn more from, uh, from focusing on the margins than you will on the, on the center, you know, because you can say, for example, about Israel, yeah, it's a, it's a high-tech uh, country, and, you know, it's a very advanced in terms Start of... Startup nation. This yeah, but this is not Israel. I'm sorry, this is not Israel. If you want to look at Israel, you have to go to, to, you know, to the backyard, not to the front yard. You have to go to the places that everyone is trying to... Uh, hide from you that will never show up in the tourist guide you know this is how you'll get uh, uh, to know Israel so I think that Tikkun Olam is exactly is exactly that is to kind of start from the margins of society like and to see how you can uh, uh, you can uh, correct or uh, rectify uh, uh, reality starting from there and and going and then starting to push more to the center. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that every character in the book, uh, I think that maybe the main question for her is whether there is some tikkun for her, whether she managed, she or he managed to do a certain tikkun, managed to uh, rectify something in their life. For example, Zizek, for example, uh, who was kidnapped as a child, to join the Russian army and spent, I don't know, 30, 40 years mm-hmm. in, the, mm-hmm. in the Russian army. So does this journey rectify something, something in his life? Because basically, you know, he missed his entire childhood, his entire life. You know, he was thrown forcefully to a desolate place in the Russian army. So is there even a sense to talk about uh, Tikkun in, uh, in Zizek's life? Mm-hmm. Uh, and also maybe funny, mm-hmm. you know, uh, does this uh, journey rectify something in her childhood, in her, you know, the fact that, you know, she grew up only with her father and her mother died at a very early age and she became attracted to death, to, uh, to the killing mm-hmm. uh, and Mende that maybe got her husband back, but whether it's the right solution for her or not, I don't know. Because, because at one point in your book, uh, yeah. Fanny's sister refused this tikkun. Yeah. Yes. She, she says like that, I don't want to. Yes, yes, yes. But Pie- Piotr Novak, who doesn't understand Jewish. And Piotr community. Novak, yeah, yeah, exactly. Piotr Novak, who grew up in a Russian society, and he was uh, anti-Semitic like most people at this time, you know, they weren't anti-Semitic in the sense that they would go and burn a house or, you know, but they were, I think that the right word that we can use that is relevant for today is a bit racist, you know, they were a bit racist toward Jews. Yeah. Uh, but it mainly derives from uh, ignorance for not knowing for not being familiar familiar with uh, with Jewish tradition, with Jewish custom, you know, even today in Israel, some people look at the Orthodox people, you know, who wear those uh, hats, and and they, I don't know if they uh, fear from them or they are, uh, I don't know, but there is also between Jews a sort of, uh, let's call it alienation, mm-hmm. you know, between different sectors. So, uh, you know, it's, it's very easy to grow up in a, in a Russian society and see all these weird people who you don't know, who speak in a different language, who wear uh, bizarre costumes and, uh, and, you know, they don't have the liberal ideas that we have today. We have to remember that in other places in the world, in the U.S. at, that, at this time, the, 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 the Afri- African Americans are being treated as slaves, you know, in other places in the world. So, you know, the time is not the time that we live in today, that we have these ideologies that, you know, human beings are human beings. 
and all these sorts of uh, liberal uh, uh, zeitgeist. Principles have pr principle are one, but living in a community. Yeah. And, uh, even now, Russian people believe when Putin says that President Zelensky, who is Jew, exactly. is Nazi. Exactly. Exactly. It's just it's, crazy. It's crazy it's for absolutely us. Absolutely crazy. It's crazy for us because yeah. we we haven't uh, we haven't learned a school this Russian narratives right about fascists for right. example. Right. Right. So it's uh, yes, everyone can use. You know, this is the thing with language. This is yeah. the danger of language that you can frame everything yeah. to look as if, uh, you know, and, and I think that Goering said it, and it's very true, that you don't need to do a lot in order to convince people to go to war. You just have to make them believe that, uh, you know, if they go to war, if they don't go to war, then uh, the enemy, you know, you just yeah. have to, educate them that there's an evil enemy uh you know just across the borders and and that's that's it the fear uh, so, the fear yeah when yeah. you when politicians speculate the fear uh, yeah. so funny your main character set off a journey to restore order in the whole world yes because the balance of existence you told was broken when her sister was left by her husband Yes. In my view, this is rather an optimistic thought, because yes. you believe that what happens between two people can affect the whole world. Yes. Do yes, you believe it's this? true. It's true. Uh, yeah, I, I actually do believe in it, uh, because, um, for example, let's take the Aguna, the Aguna uh, issue, the the chained woman. It exists even today in Judaism, I can tell you a very uh, uh, grotesque story that is uh, just happened in Israel, that uh, a husband tried to kill his wife. He really beat her uh, and he tried to murder her and he failed uh, for, it was a miracle, but she came out of it alive. And he was obviously sent to prison and uh, he's now having a trial and he's probably going to be convicted and et cetera, et cetera. But uh, obviously she uh, was in the hospital for many months and now she wants a divorce. And she can't. And she can't because he's not uh, given his uh, approval. So they had to, uh, you know, and so, so it's, it, it became absurd. You know what I mean? Yeah, of course. And I think that until uh, uh, some woman or women will gather together, it can be even in one individual uh, case. It can be even in this case. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and raise their voice, then, then it can change. Because as I said in the book, it will not come from the men because uh, it was very convenient for the men, you know, because Jewish men in the end of the 19th century could just go anywhere they wish. Uh, and, uh, you know, some of them even got remarried without giving a divorce to their previous wives. So the world was opening for Jewish men and they started to go to the US, to Odessa, to Bucharest, to, they became secular, they became liberal, they went to Palestine and the women just stayed in uh, the villages mm -hmm. with the children, very poor, mostly. So, uh, so I think, yeah, I think it can only change if uh, some woman or some women would do something. It always starts like that, you know, it always starts with the uh, with funny Kaismans mm -hmm. of the world. You, you, you are right that later on, you know, you need to have some more significant, uh, you know, uh, political power or something like that. But... Uh, even with the, uh, the fight for uh, human rights for the black people in the 60s, it started from... Uh, the woman know, in, the, in the bus. The woman in the bus and the suffragettes. And uh, it always starts like that. Mm -hmm. 
we because in general we have uh, many uh, characters in literature who are defeated by the big history like dr right. Zhivago, you know right yes usually when you when you want to fight, yes. fight with the big history you are defeated you are yes. optimistic yes <laughs> uh, you know what i wanted to end the story uh, differently yeah. and i oh, i wrote a different end to the story where she fails mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and and you I, change it and i changed it yeah from from an emotional point of view i couldn't uh, i couldn't you know i thought a lot about anna karenina and i thought a lot about uh, dr jivago dr jivago and madame bovary mm -hmm. and and i wanted uh, her to have a uh, Better ending. And happy, and happy ending, you know? Yes. Uh, I just remember, uh, David Grossman told me once that yeah. literature uh, g gives people a second chance. Yes. So you, you, you've done that. Yes. With yes. This ending. But you know, I, I'm not sure that the ending is so good because we all know what happened to, to, to all these communities. Yeah, 50 yeah. years later. So yeah, yeah. Uh, even 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 yeah. you 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 say all the time that your book does not talk about the Holocaust. Right. Your book does not talk directly about yes. the Holocaust. Yes. But yes, the Holocaust shadow. I have to tell you that thing. even even though none of my books is about the Holocaust, all of them echo uh, yeah. the Holocaust in a very strong way. I agree. It it yes. it, it was the biggest tragedy of yes. humanity so yes. it's very hard not to uh, how yeah. strong is the ultra orthodox community now in israel and what impacts what is it what is its impact on political life orthodox community in israel is very strong is very very strong first they have an enormous political power they are the one who will determine who will be Prime Minister, what it will, will be the, Netanyahu? It will it's be Netanyahu back. because they go with Netanyahu. This is why Netanyahu controls Israel so for so many years, mm -hmm. because the Orthodox uh, always go with him, mm -hmm. and they refuse to go with the other side. So they have an enormous political power. Uh, they are also, in terms of, uh, you know, demographical growth, they are the biggest, you know, they, every Orthodox family uh, are having six, seven children on average. Mm -hmm. So 20 years from now, they're even going to be stronger and stronger mm -hmm. to the extent that they will be someday the majority, I assume. And uh, so they have a, an enormous political power. Uh, they, ha they have a lot of conflicts with the government, uh, you know, in terms of uh, most of them don't, don't want to go to the army, which is mandatory in Israel. And they have a lot of problems in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, you know, economical issues because they want to learn. They want to study, they want to learn in uh, the yeshiva, but you can't make money when you learn from the yeshiva. So basically they are supported by the, by the government. And by, and by their wives. And by their wives. But when the numbers are keep growing, there is a limit to how much the government can support all these families. Mm -hmm. So there are many issues and problems and uh, conflicts. I have to say that, uh, I feel emotionally attached to this uh, community because, you know, as I said, my father comes from uh, Satumar and all those mm -hmm. places where the, the biggest rabbis and uh, strongest Orthodox communities grew. Uh, so I don't feel alienated uh, or I don't feel that, uh, you know, they need to change their way of life. I do think that they do need to take responsibility of, uh, you know, being part of Israeli society. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be the army, but, uh, you know, they need to start uh, seeing uh, the entire state and not only their, you know, individual interests. Maybe, maybe, maybe this community needs good politicians. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. The same in Romania. 
yeah, that if, there are uh, politicians who prefer that, to exactly this is the number one problem because uh, you know the politicians they think that they need to care only for the interest of their sector yeah. but they're not looking at the bigger picture which is uh, you know you always have to be in some kind of a compromise or uh, so right now, this is what Israel is, is, uh, you know, and even the president of Israel said it, that it's, uh, it's more of a mixture of tribes than, uh, than a real state, you know, there are many small sectors, everyone pushing in a different direction. So I think that even though the Zionist project has, uh, succeeded the first stage which is you know to found a state for jewish people like a state place. To construct a language to yes and the language and uh, the economy and the army and blah 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 the second stage is very far from being resolved which is the second state stage is basically what makes us live together what makes us uh, be together you know the fact that we are jews is obviously not enough because Jews is a very, you know, there are all sorts of Jews and all kinds of Jews and we have 20% Arabs. So, you know, it's not enough just to say that uh, since we are Jews, then we can live in the same place. We can also, uh, uh, so we need to kind of, I think now redefine what makes us live together? And do we even want to live together? And is Israel the best place for Jewish people now to be? Or maybe, you know, maybe Jewish people should return to uh, Europe. I don't know, what America. What you say is that trauma isn't enough anymore. Yes, well, you see a lot of people uh, uh, immigrating to uh, even Germany. A lot of Israelis live right now in Berlin. Mm -hmm. Obviously, America, which is very uh, natural for Jewish people because of the language, it's very easy. Yeah, um, yeah but uh, the, in America, it's a strong community of American Jews. Yes, and you know, there are, I don't know, six million Jews in America, something like that. So. It's very easy, you know, to find a job or to settle. Mm -hmm. So, you know, everyone is right now asking this question in Israel, like what, 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 what makes us live together? Mm -hmm. What makes us uh, want to live uh, together? Uh, as like a, a society. Mm -hmm. Like yes. a society. I have to ask you that. Uh, at one point in your life, you were funny. You were the one who, who stood up, let's say it. Yeah. Uh, I'm talking about uh, uh, that letter of combatants. Yes. The, refu the letter of refusal. What, yes. How, uh, what did it mean for you and for your life? Um, it well, was a tikkun? <laughs> yes, for sure it was a tikkun and it was one of the most meaningful uh, things that I did in my life because uh, uh, it was a certain, when I, when I told you the tikkun is to reassemble the pieces of your life. So growing up in Israel, in a, in a sort of a mainstream, uh, I had a mainstream childhood, you know, my parents came from Romania mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, they lived in a, we lived in a, in a very a nice city near Tel Aviv and, and, and like you grow up thinking that, uh, well, you know, Israel is the, is the resurrection of Jewish life, you know, after what happened in the Holocaust. I believe the name Tel Aviv means something like that, spring. Yes, and... yes, it's like, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, the mountain of spring, mm -hmm. the, the spring of, and uh, so you have to uh, take part in this effort. You have to join the army and you have to defend your country uh, just as uh, your father did and just as your you know, ancestor did when they came to Israel and we have to fight all the Arabs and all the people who wanted to kill us again and again and again. And then 
You know, um, I, I joined the army. I went to uh, be a, a fighter in, a, in an elite unit. Uh, and I did four years uh, in the army. But then I started to learn more about what I'm doing. And I started to look more. And, and, and then I was serving in the occupied territories. And I started to ask questions like, what are we doing here? And why are we supposed to be in Ramallah and Jenin and Nebulus? And, uh, and people started to tell me, well, you know, you have to defend your country and these are your enemies. And so I started to ask questions, for example, okay, what we have an, a lot of enemies, we have enemies in Iran, but we don't uh, go to Tehran and we don't go, we don't go to Beirut or Damascus or, you know, so why are we here? Why can't we defend our country from, uh, I don't know, from the border? And then I realized that we have no borders. Israel, I don't know if a lot of people know it, but Israel doesn't have borders. And then, I, and then they started to say, well, there are Jewish villages that you have to defend. Yes, but these are settlements. These are not Jewish villages that uh, are uh, agreed upon in the international law and uh, are recognized by, you know, even not by our own standards. You know, there are many Jewish uh, places that do not belong to Israel even from Israel point of view, but they are there, mm -hmm. you know, and so, uh, and then it became, you know, uh, my own experience as a soldier, you know, and doing every year, you have to do another 40 days of uh, reservist kind of service. You have to, you know, whatever you do, you have to put on your uniform, uniform and for 40 days you have to serve in the army so when i became older and older and older you know when i was 26 or 7 it was almost unbearable so uh, i wrote together with a friend a letter that uh, announces that we refuse to serve in the occupied territories we are willing to serve and defend israel in its borders you know in, in the north in the south but we are not willing to oppress the Palestinian people anymore. And yeah, it was a tikkun for me because for me, it was sort of a thing that I realized that, yeah, I am willing to defend Israel. I am willing to defend Israel because I think that uh, Israel is a very uh, important, uh, maybe the most important establishment for Jewish life nowadays. But I'm not willing uh, that Israel will become an oppressor. You know, uh, I'm not willing to cross that line in terms of my own ethics and, and, and morality. So, yeah, it was a very meaningful uh, act. And a lot of people joined us back then. It was like uh, around 1,000 soldiers joined us eventually. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. And it... Uh... Do you, do, you, do you really believe that the so-called two-state solution? Yeah. What yeah. about it? whether it's uh, possible? It's, yeah. to, today, I don't know. I, I, was, uh, I, I really believed in it. Uh, but today, in the past 10 years or something like that, first of all, from a practical point of view, it's very hard because there are already around uh, half a million settlers. So I don't know how you take half a million people out of their houses. I don't think it's possible. So let's assume they will make some arrangements and leave the settlers and give the Palestinian other territories instead of that. To be honest, uh, I, I don't know. I, I don't see other solution because I think that the one, one state solution will be terrible from many aspects because uh, I think that, you know, uh, we are very different societies. And, uh, you know, when you look, for example, on little things, which are for me the biggest things like human rights, women rights, gay, lesbian rights, mm -hmm. you know, how would a society with, uh, I don't know, there are 5 million Palestinians who are mostly 
religious to some extent, mm -hmm. and then you add the religious Jews. Mm -hmm. So what kind of state would you have that most of them don't believe in uh, yeah. gay, lesbian rights or that uh, women can have uh, uh, equal, equal rights? So what would this society look like? So I think that the one state solution is, is not uh, something I would like to, uh, to see. A two state solution seems reasonable, but it would have to be, I think, uh, creative in some sense, like uh, in terms of practical issues, like the territories themselves, Jerusalem would probably have to be like an international. Yeah district i think that uh, they should allow palestinians maybe to live in israel if they wish and vice versa i don't know they could vote for the palestinian state but maybe live in israeli territories or something like that i think that some creative crazy solution <laughs> would would have to be but right now nobody wants it i think nobody in israel is interested in it especially not the government, uh, not this government, and, and of course not Netanyahu's government. But this government had his chance. It was the government without yes. Netanyahu, it was the government with Arab... But Netanyahu doesn't want it. He doesn't want it. He doesn't want to return territories. He doesn't believe... He thinks that if there will be a Palestinian state, it will be like the Hamas in Gaza. And he doesn't want it. So uh, for him, if you ask me or the right, the right doesn't know what they want. They know what they don't want. They don't want the Palestinian state, mm -hmm. but they don't want. They don't know what they, they do want. Uh, so what what's happening is that it's just that the situation is just continuing. You know, we are uh, occupying the territories. We are oppressing an entire, uh, pe you know, people, four or five million people. And uh, the situation just continues. And by the way, it can also continue for many years to come. Mm. It's like a status quo. Yes. Like this. And the world, the world seems to be okay with it. You know, we don't hear like uh, a lot of resistance from, uh, from Europe, from the US or from, whatever so uh so it can it can also continue for many years to come and that's the the worst solution this status yes. quo never ending uh, status it's the quo. worst solution because meanwhile the settlers will be two million people and, yeah, uh, and the hamas will become more and, and the more hamas people. will be more and more in power and everyone will be more extreme yeah will get more extreme and there will be more and more terror attacks yeah. And uh, and uh, we will keep bleeding and bleed each other uh, until some something will happen. Maybe maybe when generation change, because I look uh, to my daughter, she's eighteen, and her generation is very different from mine. Yes, yes, but I think that uh, the generation can also change for the worst because. Yeah. Uh, when their generation are growing up in, in oppression, when they see all the time IDF soldiers coming to their houses and arresting people, and our generation yeah. sees that, why do, why do we need to do peace with them? I mean, everything is okay like that. We don't see any, you know? Right now we, we're at the point that there's uh, more or less peace and quiet in Israel from time to time, every year or two, you get some missiles from Gaza but usually it takes a few weeks and it's over. So, you know, um, it can also go uh, to, the, to, the, to the more pessimistic side. Yeah, you are more pessimistic in real life than in your literature. <laughs> so uh, it's my last question. Have you ever been in Romania? Of course, I've been many times in Romania. Actually, before the Corona, mm -hmm. I uh, did with my mother a trip to where she was born and where she lived and we met for all her friends mm. and it was amazing. When I wrote my second book, I was three months in Romania. Where, where I, took a, I took a house in a village called, uh, it was near uh, Brasov, I think. Peștera. 
Usteni or something Usteni. like that. It's a and very busy village. <laughs> yes, and I was three months writing the book in Romania, and I've been to Romania like five, six times. I love it. I hope you will come uh, to Romania uh, for your yeah, book. Sure, I would love to. I would love because to. you know, uh, I, I understand from uh, from the editor that that is a very well received book. Yeah, I hope so. I heard uh, a lot of people are reading it, and uh, yeah. my my. My mother friends are buying uh, copies for everyone, so. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. It, it was you. really a joy, it took an hour, but it was. Uh, thank you, was thank you, Magda, thank, thank you. you. I enjoyed it, thank you, bye-bye.